Hi everyone, I'm not quite sure why I'm doing this, but you know, we're in a pandemic and we've got to entertain ourselves. So I have decided to do a themed reading vlog. I find those really fun. Um, if they're themed and I try and do them in a short period of time, it helps keep me energized. As I said, gotta keep ourselves <laughs> entertained. So I decided to read the 10 shortest books on my TBR. I have excluded short story collections and poetry collections because they are normally quite short. And to be fair, I haven't been that exact about it. I just walked around my shelves and pulled off the ones that look the shortest. I don't know how quickly I'm gonna be able to read them. I would love to do something ridiculous and try and read them. I'm filming this on Friday afternoon. I would love to read them over the course of this weekend, but I don't really see that happening. But I would like to do it relatively quickly because this should be a challenge. <laughs> um, I'm not gonna talk about them in depth now because I'm obviously gonna talk about them as I read them. So let me just tell you what they are. Also, half of these books are books in translation and four of those books are books by women in translation. And in August, it is Women in Translation Month. So if you're looking for, well, I don't know if they're gonna be recommendations yet because I haven't read them, but if you're looking for books that are translated into English and are written by women, you may want to check out some of these. I have done previous videos where I have recommended books by women in translation. I may do an up-to-date one this year as well. We'll see how we go. So the books on my TBR. Firstly, we have The White Book by Han Kang, which is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith. I have read all of Han Kang's books currently in translation in English, though she's written many more in Korean. This book is an exploration of the color white. Then we have, I think, the only book in translation, again, that I haven't read by this author, who is Amelie Northam, and this is translated from the French by... Alison Anderson. Um, and again, I'm not gonna speak about it, I'll speak about it when I read it. It's really tempting to try and talk about the books as we go, because I would normally do that, but later, later. This is The Cook by Melita Karingal. This is translated from the French by, I assume by Sam Taylor, because he normally translates her work. Yes, by Sam Taylor. I loved The Heart, which is called Mend the Living in the UK. I want to read more of her work. I also have Ruth Izeki's The Face. I have a vivid memory of buying this and saying in the hall that I looked forward to reading this one soon. And I think that was two years ago. Great. Likewise, I've had this one on my TBR for quite a long time. This is Six Guns Snow White by Catherine M. Valenti. Um, yeah. Then we have these two, which have not been on my TBR for very long at all. This is All the Small, no, All the Little Places by Sophie Shiletto. And this one is folklore inspired. I also have Pew by Catherine Lacey, which I've spoken about a little bit because I hauled it recently and I think it was in my five star predictions video too. And I've heard such good things about this book, but recently Matthew Sharapa read it and hated it. So I look forward to seeing whether or not I love it or hate it. This is Pet by Akweke Amezi. I read their book Fresh Water when it was, was it longlisted or shortlisted for the Women's Prize? I think it was longlisted a couple of years ago and this is their middle grade book. I have this pamphlet here called At the Edge of the Wood by Matasugo Ono and it's translated from the Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter. I bought this in foils. I remember they had a selection of these by this specific publisher which is um, Kashiki New Voices from Japan. This is number six in their pamphlet series. So I want to read this and see if I would like to read more from their series. And I also have Territory of Light by Yuko Toshima, and this is translated from the Japanese by Geraldine Harcourt. So those are the 10 books that I'm gonna be reading in the next few days. However many days it takes me to get through them, I will show you what I'm getting up to in the meantime. You know the usual, cooking, stuff like that. So, Grab a cup of tea and join me.
Hello, it is halfway through Saturday, slightly more than halfway through Saturday, and I have finished three books, so I thought I would tell you about them. The first one that I read was The Cook by Melita Karangal, which as I mentioned is translated from the French by Sam Taylor. I enjoyed this book. I didn't love this book. In fact, there were some parts of this book where I felt a little bored, which is not what you want to feel about any book, but especially not a book that's only a hundred pages. This is about a chef called Maro, but we don't hear from him at all. It's his biography is told from the point of view of an unnamed woman, and we don't know how she knows him. Later on in the book, she refers to herself as his friend, but at the beginning, she doesn't appear to be his friend. In fact, you could read it as it having this quite sinister edge to it. The beginning of the book, she's looking out at the window and she's watching him wind through the streets. Then she goes to his restaurant and she samples his food. In the beginning, it's not a restaurant that he owns, it's just one that he works at. And she keeps going to the restaurants as he moves from place to place and she goes on her own. And there's this really unnerving scene where she's waiting for him to, um, to come out as a chef and to say hello to everyone who's come to this opening of a restaurant. And she's sitting at a table on her own. And the only sinister thing that's mentioned is that she's reading a thriller. And I love that little nudge that you can read her as a stalker who is following this man around as if it was a thriller that you were reading. But this book is definitely not a thriller. It's about the chef and it's about his love of food. Though having this narrated by a mysterious woman who we never got to know, who has somehow infiltrated herself into this chef's life, is intriguing. She also kind of dissects him as a person, not literally, but she's trying to work out why he is the way he is, both from a distance at first and then by becoming his friend. And it's like she's trying to work him out as a dish on a plate, that's how I read it, as though she's trying to figure out, not to sound cliche, the recipe that makes up who he is as a human. And I thought that, that was endearing. I also loved the um, discussion on food and the translation of food and how it moves around from place to place and people have their own spin on it, almost like their own colloquialisms when it comes to food. And that is mirrored in the fact that obviously this is a book in translation, but Marrow himself moves from country to country and also is in relationships with people who don't speak the same language that he does. So there's a lot of different cultures that he's experiencing, um, which feeds into, no pun intended, his food and uh, also the way she, the narrator, talks about him. I suppose another reason it feels sinister is because in a way it feels like she wants to consume him like the food that he creates. Some of the um, phrasing in this book, like with Men the Living or the Heart, is just mm, so delightful. I, here's a passage that I've underlined. It says, nowadays people talk about that pocket kitchen as if it were some sorcerer's lair, where Maro, this self-taught chef from nowhere, brewed his potions. That little box room is mythologized into the beating heart of a magic factory producing wondrous meals that changed and evolved day after day. So yeah, I enjoyed this one and it's made me keen, hungry, to pick up Tiny Moons um, by Nina Mingus Powell's, which I know is not the same apart from that they're both talking about food, but it's made me want to read books about food. I also read At the Edge of the World by Matasuga Ono, and this is translated from the Japanese by Juliet Winters Carpenter. It's very, very short. It's only 44 pages. It's two stories with the same characters, and it is about a husband and his son. His wife is pregnant with their second child, and she's worried that the forest is somehow going to cause harm to their child, or is going to steal it away. And so she decides to leave them and go and stay with her mother for a while. So it's about the time that they're spending alone in this house in the middle of the woods. It's steeped in folklore. The woods feel like, or indeed are, alive. It says, the trees pat each other familiarly on the shoulders and back and sometimes wriggle their hips as they hurry on ahead. They huddle their green leaves together, absorbed in whispering, paying us, no mind. In the first story, an old woman comes out of the forest and into their house for seemingly an unknown reason. And in the second story, a bakery appears as if out of nowhere in a Hansel and Gretel kind of way. And both of these things come together to link in with the themes of life and death and sustenance, giving you food to sustain life. I did think that it was magical and I loved particularly the descriptions of the forest and the moving trees. 
there were places where it very much felt like a man writing about a woman's body in a way that just, I think we've all read extracts in books like that and that made me roll my eyes slightly. Um, but on the whole, I really enjoyed it. I also read The Face by Ruth Ezeki, which is charming. So this is an experiment that she's doing where she's forcing herself to look at her face in the mirror for three hours straight and she has to write down or record via vo voice note her thoughts as she goes. And this is based on a few things. Um, a art teacher who tells his students to go and stare at a painting for three hours and record their thoughts, but also Buddha who told his um, followers to sit on the ground and meditate whilst staring at decomposing corpses in order to be confronted with the things that they were scared of and disgusted by and therefore be okay with it. So she's saying that her face is not a work of art, but it is a body and it is getting older and she would kind of like to confront the reality of that and really study herself in a way that will probably make her feel uncomfortable. And not only uncomfortable, but also bored. But maybe she's bored because she is deflecting, she's not focusing enough because it makes her feel uncomfortable. So in this, she's writing about her family and what was really lovely with the bits of her family that she could see in herself. So she says she's inher inherited her father's deep eye bags and they used to really annoy her and it was something that she hated about her face. But now that her dad is no longer with her, seeing those bags just feels like her dad is part of her and she likes that. She finds that really comforting. She says, when I look myself in the eye, it's hard to look away. Eyes define a face. If we were not such visual creatures, if we received our sensory input some other way, maybe we would not need faces. Trees do not need faces. Jellyfish do not need faces. Daisies do, and they don't have eyes. So perhaps I'm wrong about this. She talks about growing up as a mixed race person. She says on her birth certificate, her father's race is recorded as white and her mother's race as yellow. And often when she was a child, people would come up to her and say, not who are you, but what are you? And she talks about how she internalized so much of that and she would join in with racist games at school and allow herself to be the butt of a joke because she felt it was the only way to get the white children in her class to like her. She also talks about masks a lot um, culturally in this, which felt very apt at the moment. Um, and it's just, it was funny as well. She's trying to be aware of herself, but she's also trying to shut off part of her brain that's telling her that what she's doing is ridiculous. So in some ways it makes you kind of revert back to your child self when you're doing that, because it's, it's like that never ending question, are we there yet? She's looking at her face going, am I zen yet? Have I achieved that yet? Is it time to stop? Um, and I, I like that she didn't hide that frustration during this experiment. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed this a lot. I have been wanting to make ramen for ages. I miss bone daddies, but it's been so hot. I haven't wanted to stand over the stove and make ramen, but it's been raining today and the temperature has gone down quite a bit. So I'm gonna make ramen this evening and hopefully read um, a bit more and I'll come back to you this evening and I will also show you the ramen that I'm making too.
The ramen was yummy, not as delicious as Bone Daddy's, but it was still very good. And speaking of very good, I have read this book here, which is brilliant. I want to reread it already, but as we know, I have other books <laughs> to be getting on with, but this book is fantastic. This is Pew by Catherine Lacey. It is about someone who is discovered sleeping on a pew in a church, in this specific pew that belongs, doesn't belong, but everyone in this local community has their pew that they go and sit on on a Sunday. And this family gets there and they found this person sleeping on this bench. So they decide to call this person Pew because the person will not tell them what their name is. And these people say, okay, we're gonna be good Christians and we're gonna take Pew back to our house and we're gonna help you. And initially it sounds nice, you think, oh, well, they're being good Samaritans. Okay, no, <laughs> no. These people and this community, it's so intense, it's so intense and there's so much going on under the surface and it makes you feel so uncomfortable and so awkward and mm, so, sorry, I realize I'm just making lots of noises, but this book, it made me make noises, okay? So they want you to tell them what their name is and where they come from and what their gender is because they can't really work it out from their appearance. They want to know what their nationality is too because they're not sure by Pew's appearance either. And they want Pew to fill out lots of forms and validate their existence by the rules that society has said we should all follow and they, this family, this community are absolutely upholding. And it really feels like a mixture of the film Get Out and Shirley Jackson's short story The Lottery feels like they came together and they had a book baby because this family keep on talking about the festival, the forgiveness festival, that's going to be happening shortly and they really hope that Pew can be a part of it. But the more that Pew doesn't tell them the things that they say that they need to know in order to feel safe, the meaner and the more hostile these people become. And it is like Jesus rocked up in their church and they're treating Jesus like crap. They have some people in their community who they have accepted as uh, refugees from other places, but they make them perform in the way that they want them to perform in order to be part of their local community, much like Get Out. They strip them of their own identity and they make them adhere to their own whiteness. And it is so, oppressive. This book, Pew, builds and builds and builds and builds. It feels like it's, it feels like a bomb that's going to go off and you're not really sure how it's going to end and therefore the ending felt like a little bit of a, a firework that didn't go off properly. But actually I think on reflection, and I'm gonna have to sit with it for quite a while so I'll talk about it in, in my end of month wrap up, I think probably it's a very good ending. Um, it's deliberately like that. It's deliberately leading you along to something huge and then it veers off somewhere else. And it's kind of, I guess, defying that expectation in the same way that Pew refuses to conform to the character's expectations of who they should be. This book is refusing to conform to your expectations of where, where it's going and what it's going to be. So I enjoyed that. It's frustrating, but it's supposed to be frustrating. So I will allow it, that's fine. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna think about that some more and then I'll come back to you, as I said in my wrap up. But we also have my first DNF and it is Six Guns Snow White by Catherine M. Valenti. I love her Fairyland series and I haven't loved anything else by her that I've read as much as that. This I knew was a retelling of Snow White, of course, <laughs> but I didn't know what that retelling entailed before going into it and it was just a book that made me feel very uncomfortable and I don't have much to say about it. The premise of the story is it's about a white man, a cowboy, who wants a wife and so he goes to a tribe of Native Americans and he forces one of the women to marry him. They have a child who is Snow White and then his wife dies by suicide. He remarries a white woman and both of them hate this daughter. They treat her appallingly, they say they want to bleach her skin, etc. I got about a a third of the way through, I think, and I know that it is a commentary on, and a valid commentary on the abuse of indigenous people, but because it's a fairy tale retelling and it's very distanced because of that, it feels like it's being used as a device. And I just, 
it just felt like quite an insensitive thing to use in a story. So um, I'm not going to read this one. I'm going to put it to one side and hopefully um, the other books that I have on my TBR I will enjoy much more tomorrow. As well as reading tomorrow I'm going to get up early. I got a text from Sana saying that she's going to be cycling in this area tomorrow and did I fancy a wave and a hello and um, yes because I have seen no one apart from um, Lena, as you know, if you've been watching these videos. And apparently what I do now, um, whenever anyone, and by anyone I mean Lena, comes by where we live, I say, would you like some food? And I want to cook food for people and then throw it out the window at them. So I'm gonna ask Sana if she would like a loaf of bread, which I will not film because I filmed myself making bread today. Um, and you don't need to see that twice. Um, so I will check in with you tomorrow once I have read more books and uh, yeah, I'll stop talking now. Bye, see you tomorrow. You are currently balanced on a coaster and some candles. Um, I gave bread to Sana. I've spoken to Jean. I've also read three books. So let me talk to you about them. I read Pet by Akweke Emezi. And I need to sit with this one. There is so much packed into the 200 pages of this middle grade book. It is about a young, um, well, not she's not that young. I think, is she 15? I think she's 15. A 15 year old girl called Jam. And her mother is an artist and she has created a painting that essentially Jam helps accidentally bring to life. And this painting who um, is called Pet says that they have come to hunt a monster. So in the world that Jam lives in, all the monsters has, have been caught or killed. And you can read that as a fantastical thing, but as the novel progresses, we realise that they're talking about bad people in general. So bad people getting caught for doing bad things. We're talking about people who abuse other people. We're talking about murderers. So they're saying that they have cleansed society of all the badness, and Pet has arrived to say, actually, that's not true, and it's up to Jam to try and find out what this new monster is. Pet says that the monster is in her friend Redemption's house. It is it's a heavy book and an important book for children to read. It also has great representation in it. Jam is a trans girl and that's not part of the plot apart from it's just who she is and that is referenced and explained at the beginning. She's also got a lot of anxiety and um, therefore she signs a lot instead of speaking sometimes. The librarian, who's a person that she knows and likes and goes to see a lot, is a wheelchair user. The way this book talks about mental health is complex and important. It says, whenever she was really scared or freaked out, the same thing always happened. She began to dissociate, reality loosing around her like a hammock deconstructing itself, spilling her into sands of nothingness. In many ways this book reminded me of Angels of New York and also Amongst the Calls. It aims so high and does things in a kid's book that I have rarely seen done before. And the use of art in both bringing pet to life and how art plays a part later in the book in exploring trauma I think is brilliantly done. So I really, yeah, 
high praise for that book. I then read All the Little Places by Sophie Shillitoe. She wrote this when she was commuting on a train to work and you can tell that she wrote it that way because it feels like lots of fragments that have been pulled together and it also feels like you're visiting lots of people quite quickly as if you are going past them um, on the train. If you enjoyed If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things by John McGregor I think you will really like this because it tiptoes into lots of different people's living rooms and then wanders out again um, and it's just not specifically looking for plot, but is just curious and interested in people. I would have liked more of an anchor to the book itself, um, but it was very poetic. And I am very excited to see what she writes next. Let me give you, an, I just wanna give you an example of how fantastic the writing is. The winter moon won't go to bed. It's a day moon, a nighttime ghost haunting waking hours, looming over the field. Mist hangs low, a jellyfish undulating above the ground, translucent and floating. It moves around the legs of the cattle, giving them a tall petticoat to wear, hiding their ankles. They stand together around a trough, hooking mouthfuls of straw with their pink tongues. And then I have finished The White Book by Han Kang, which is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith. This is quite different to her other books. It feels like a series of... I was going to say this, like this is a legitimate description of something. A series of ghost poems. Let me just look that up in the dictionary and, and work out what I mean by that. I think I said at the beginning of this video that this book is an exploration of the colour white. And it is that, but it's more giving her sister a life as something that exists in art form because her sister was born before she was but prematurely and did not live and so she writes about her sister and what her life could have been and imagines her walking through the countryside looking at everything that is white the clouds and the snow and she associates her sister with the color white because her mother said that her face was like a rice cake and Hong Kong says she couldn't really understand what she meant by that until she saw an uncooked rice cake. And she thought, okay, so that must be the colour, that colour before the rice cake is cooked, before a person has, has bloomed enough in order to be able to survive. So this is a really, it's a really sad book in many ways. It really does feel like a piece of art and there are photographs in here as well. So it's a mixed media. So I have read eight books now two to go and I think I should be able to finish them today but before I continue reading I really want to make a lemon meringue pie not really for any reason apart from that's what I would like to do so <laughs> I'm going to do that and crack on with reading and I'll come back to you later this evening
I thought I was recording and I wasn't recording. <laughs> and I wanted to show you my piece of lemon pie before I ate it, but um, I started eating it. It looks so not appetizing right now because this is the first slice that I cut from the pie. And that's always very messy to do. And then every other slice after that looks delightful. And also I've just eaten some of it because I thought I was recording and I wasn't. So um, here is the lemon meringue pie. Um, yeah, I wish I could send you some through the screen, but I can't. I'm sorry. Let me stop being rude. I've put that down and I will finish that after I've spoken to you. So it is late, but, and I am knackered, <laughs> but I did it. I finished the books. We're going to be annoying and say I didn't read all 10 because I DNF'd Six Gun Snow White. I'm going to let myself have this. I'm going to say that it was an achievement. Okay, let me have this. There is a pandemic on. Okay, so the ninth book that I read was Life Form by Emily Northam. This is her uh, 19th novel. And I have read, I think most of her books that have been translated into English. I definitely have read all of the books that I own of hers that have been translated into English. Um, and there's a lot of them, there is a lot. And I talked about this when I read her book, Strike Your Heart, which I think was last year. You kind of fall into a rhythm with Emily Northam and like with Murakami books, a lot of her books end up feeling kind of the same. And sometimes you mind that and sometimes you don't. What is weird reading Emily Northam is that I've been reading her now for 16 years, I think, about 16 years. And there are things I loved about her books when I started reading them that now I'm looking them, at them with a more critical eye and I'm thinking, really? I, I don't know. This book is strange. She talks about herself as another person, which she often does in her books. So this is an epistolary novel, though it does have bits that are not letters inside, where a man is writing to an author called Emily Northam, who's not her, but has written all the same books that she has written and is writing to her to tell him that her books have saved him and he says that he is in the US Army based in Iraq and that he is not coping and the way that he is not coping as a soldier there is by eating a lot and he says that he is grateful for the way that she has written her fat characters with dignity and I was thinking is that true? I don't think that she actually has done that. At its core, this book centers around the question, what is fiction and who gets to write it? And I suppose it's performative trickery. You think that she is writing about herself as this fictional character and inventing a fictional character to write about her fictional self to praise her for the creation of her other fictional characters, which is already meta enough but then it turns out that's not quite what is happening and I can't tell you what is happening without spoiling the book but it has all of these layers of falsehood in it I think I like the idea of it I just didn't particularly love the execution I finished on a high though I finished by reading this which was the last one on my TBR which is Territory of Light by Yuko Shima which is translated from the Japanese by Geraldine Harcourt I bought this in foils last year, I think it was on their staff recommendations section, which is always a great place to be. And I read the first couple of pages, loved the way it was written. Since then, Penguin have brought out a different edition, which I think looks slightly more beautiful than this one, even though I do, do love this. This is what the other cover looks like. I'm definitely gonna purchase her other book, which has been translated into English, which is called Child of Fortune. And the cover of that looks like this. I found this book really subtle and moving. It's about a woman whose husband leaves her but is then gaslighting her into thinking that she's the one who left him. He says, you know, you need to find a new apartment with our daughter. And she does that. She's drawn to this building, this flat that's above a series of offices. She's the only people who live there. Um, the only people, she's the only person who lives in the building. And that makes her feel like she's looking out over the world, but she's also drawn to it because the building has the same name as her husband. Um, his surname so people often think that she owns the building when she doesn't and it's about her acclimatizing to her new way of life and becoming really detached from herself there are lots of things that she notices lots of deaths happening around her in these odd circumstances and these 
flashes of light and light that seems to come out of bodies. It's like the world telling her to live again, I suppose. Um, she doesn't always act in the best way. She takes out her stresses and her woes on her daughter. She's not very understanding. She shouts at her daughter when she cries and wets the bed and she can't see that that's because she is acting in a way that makes her daughter do those things. So it's this cycle that she needs to break out of and that can be really uncomfortable to read at points. Um, I just, I, I don't know, I just, I, I found this really enthralling and it's slow but feels really measured, um, not rushed at all. It was written in the 70s and it, it feels like it could be written much more recently than that. The one thing I felt about this book was that I felt that she repeated facts, almost backstory in various places, which made me pause and think, well wait, You've already told us that, and this is a short book, you don't need to tell us it again. But then at the end I read the um, blurb and it said this was first serialised in a magazine, so I can see why there were certain recaps. Those probably could have been taken out for the book itself. So yeah, I, I would recommend this one, heartily. And that's the end! Those are the end of the 10 books, the 10 shortest books on my TBR. I hope that you enjoyed watching this video. My standouts were definitely Pew, Pet, and um, Territory of Light. Uh, I have had a joyful time and I am very full of food. <laughs> Bread and ramen and lemon meringue pie. I hope that you all have had a good weekend. I imagine this will be going up a few days later than normal because it might take me longer to edit, but I hope that you have liked it. And I will be back with another video soon. If you're new to my channel, please do subscribe. It will be lovely to have you around. Uh, yeah, lots of love. Bye.